even the soldiers who who are hitting us, who are shooting us as Palestinians, um, maybe they are um, they they are forced to do this. We must to to work uh, to continue to believe. We must to work with the people in the ground. We must to change the atmosphere in the ground. You, you need right. to have a shared vision That's for the future happen. of your country, no, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, for the future no, yeah. of your city, La Madina. That's why we are trying to find uh, some kind of an understanding that these physical borders will not be there anymore. The idealizations, the new states of existence or states of coexistence should always come from stakeholder perspectives. They should not come from the top. In general, our life in the in society. There's people that um, try to live a normal life, and because of the situation, because of the conflict, their life is very miserable. Women are losing their child, the, uh, sisters are losing their brothers, they're losing their dad, and, um, they are under, they are in prison. You you see on the on the children. Or in all kinds of situations that they have something that they, they fear of. Because we're suffering uh, through the checkpoints, uh, through the occupation. Look, my father let me when I have two, day, when I have two days. And he spent the 12 years old in Israeli chains. If I remind them that this is my house, they're not going to recognize it and take it the same way. Because I lived there three or four years and they lived there 18 years. Uh, uh, very near there are some uh, uh, soldiers, there is the uh, Turkish army and uh, a, it's a feeling of uh, little insecurity. I'm living in Kibbutz Zikim and I'm working in the Kibbutzim movement. We arrived to Zikim just to understand where we are. So Gaza Street, it's just here. This, is, this building are already Gaza Street. It's very pastoralic, but not when they bomb us. There was no interaction between Greek and Turkish Cypriots, especially after 74, there was no interaction whatsoever. I, I, I don't like people being divided. Uh, I believe that in Cyprus it's an artificial division. People used to work and live together and then this division was brought. And he lived a hard years and difficult years in that year. Particularly when he is in the military jail, not in for civilians. To have human rights, to, to have the right for each person to live here in the society. Uh, to be free to do whatever you want to, uh, to have the, um, the right to, to learn, to study, uh, to, to go for uh, trips, to, to visit the sea. They don't have to live like this. Their life could be different if there was peace, because this region has a tremendous potential. It's, a, it's almost like a, an embarrassment to our humanity. It's, it's, it's embarrassing that we cannot build the bridge between these two people who historically were able to coexist. One of the windows has a shutter that's a door, that's a big metal slab. 
that's the safety rules that every building has to put in. The soldiers came one day at night at 3 a.m. and they took my father. We, we don't deal with the situation, we just leave it. Occupation is uh, killed. Uh, uh, the member in uh, my family, uh, my fathers, my brothers. How did you feel that night? Were you awake? Um, yes, I was awake. They they awaked us up. They were the way they were hitting the door, the way they were knocking the door with their guns like this. And also, they learn about the conflict and they see that there is other people in the other side that also uh, feel the the terrible results of the, of this conflict. <laughs> if we are suffering, of course. Uh, we are to blame as well. Uh, I don't want to say, okay, the foreigners came and divided us uh, so that we are pure. The, this, this, this people is uh, it's, it's our neighbors. How, how you can, how we can, how we can live and build the the, the future for our children, and we have a big conflict and a big conflict with 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 our neighbors. How? to say again one thing that I'm, I'm sure I can say is that when I went first through although I went through a border uh, for many years and still perhaps up to now the borders are still there inside you inside me in that case border for me is a kind of a line that um, uh, that doesn't let me get through something or uh, that uh, kind of um, constrains some things for me. Order to, to me is, is in Cyprus uh, is a painful thing and actually we try not to use the word border. Yeah. Why? Uh, we use kind of like a division line. It's, it just happened, it was imposed on us. The word border always reminds me, of course, of the division of, of my country. Uh, and, and this uh, imposes a border in my mind, because I, I cannot cross over there. And we couldn't cross for many years. Um, it needs me from Jerusalem to Bethlehem 15 minutes only to, to go to the university. But instead, with the um, checkpoints and with the barriers, I need two hours a day to go from my home to the university. With conflict, it's in both sides of the borders, and the civilians in both sides of the borders they don't have the, uh, uh, they cannot push the button of, uh, of the dealing with situation. Everything we want to to bring from outside the country. We have to take permission from Israel and uh, most of the time they don't give us. Sometimes for me to call the border it takes 10 minutes, sometimes it take 2 hours, sometimes 3 hours, sometimes I arrive and they, I am retained for some special reason. But of course we are also aware that there are borders on our minds. Many of them are most of, most of the time imaginative. They really don't exist. So the history is very painful. And the fact that we are now at this spot and divides this island, this beautiful land, into two separate entities is very painful to me, that's all. And I think it's, 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 a, it's almost like a, an embarrassment to our humanity. The borders are usually sort of labeling the other. 
as, as the enemy or as, uh, as, as something that inhuman. Sometimes the other side uh, looks at you with a stereotype picture without knowing you uh, as you. We, we don't want to make uh, our city more beautiful than it, but we w want them to know our society as it. When we first met, the situation was were with the United Nations. Who am I? And what is he? Mayor? No, no. Oh, what is your name? Me, Mayor? No, no. You are a Greek. You are the mayor of the Greek part of Nicosia, and I am the mayor of the Turkish part of Nicosia, and we don't recognize each other. You tell them that there is uh, bad people in the other side of the of the border, but not all of them. I don't hate anyone to start with, but uh, I mean, some people believe in, in, in peace, while others believe that this is our country and we have to get this country back. Um, everything that, that, that they now have belonged once to us. But this is the land where Jesus walked. There's no question about this. My mother wouldn't allow me to take my bike and go to the Turkish area which I was doing every now and then and playing with the Turkish kids but uh, I wasn't telling my parents because they would uh, tell me that this is not a good idea that I would be in danger that they might uh, kidnap me or kill me. Unfortunately you see the national narratives are practically part of the propaganda. Uh, stereotypes in a conflict area is when people have a wrong picture of what the concept means. Propaganda continues, uh, maybe uh, sometimes openly, sometimes in a kind of a more sophisticated, hidden way. So if I'm taught that all of the Palestinians are terrorists, or the ter Palestinians are taught that all of the Israelis are, uh, are brutal soldiers, if you never have a chance to meet an Israeli, and you never have a chance yeah, to meet a Palestinian, then that's what, that's what you have. What he hears is only half of this story, and maybe it's a distorted form of the story because, like uh, his or her counterpart on the other side, also is going through the same uh, disinformation or misinformation. Not to say that now we have freedom of press, we still don't have it. It's going to take a, a long time and uh, changing the architecture of the media system as well. But. Uh, uh, when you have only limited perspectives being uh, broadcasted through the media, and the media is so powerful, uh, they uh, reverberate the same narrative. It's a, it's a misperception of the problem, that, uh, of the situation that creates the conflicts, actually. It's, it's one of the reasons why it's difficult to communicate with, uh, with the other side. No matter if they speak the same language, they have different concepts, different uh, terms, codes. The, the moment you can see the world from the eyes of another person standing or sitting somewhere else, you see more of the world. And the challenge that I see is in order to create new stereotypes or new data about situations that do not exist, we need to forget, we need to defactualize. Yeah. Perhaps the most important political action one can do as a person is to meet at least one person from the other side and be able to say that he's a friend with you. Because otherwise they stay with these generalizations and this uh, labeling, um, stereotyping of course, from whatever sources of information is uh, is uh, sort of uh, exposed. We can live without, without, uh, without the checkpoint.
without wall. We can talk with uh, with Israeli people, and we can talk directly. Any kind of a solution that is going to be materialized on your territories, أي حل مادي راح يكون في المناطق تاعكم will definitely need. The commitment of Palestinians and Israelis. And the idea of this project is to strengthen civil society in Israel and in Palestine, and um, and strengthen the awareness to issues like uh, of democracy and civil rights, in order to um, broaden the base of uh, people. And the society. In the case of the Palestinians and the Israelis, we started this dialogue by asking them to design an alternative world, an alternative world of symbiosis, of coexistence. Who are you as a citizen, or just a person deciding to get out of the mainstream paradigm, which is we are, they are the bad guys and we are the victims? to go out there and meet somebody from the other community to do what? And initially they were reluctant to get engaged. There was yeah. the first time I meet uh, Israeli people there and I negotiate with them and I talk to them so I can understand what do they think about us. So for them they are very hero that they coming to meet us, that they want to talk about the peace process and about the, the, the solutions and the relationship. And uh, they make a very, very big step for that. We, we try to identify all these concepts uh, that might be, uh, and might make the other person from the other community feel uncomfortable. We, we reach resonance. Business is is rich that I have rights and you have rights. You have a basic, I have basic human needs and you have basic human needs. So the solution, the transcendent solution, it will be based in basic human needs. As what we call history, what we usually think of is something uh, objective there. Well, in fact, it's something that we construct by selecting collectively, perhaps. What do you consider sort of as the uh, the official history? So just by by living together or next to each other, just that creates uh, some ties. And then if they uh, get if they get rid of the uh, propaganda ideas that they had in their mind before, then that makes them look for their future and decide about the future through the dialogue. They created. A, a database or a, a description of another future which did not contain aspects of the current situation. We create better relationships and bonds if we actually work together. They have common future. This is what the whole situation is. We have a conflict, okay, but we both live in the same situation, so in the same area. And we, uh, there is a lot of things that can happen that they can help both of us, or they can benefit both of us. When we reach a transcendent solution, it will be good to make a normal relationship with you because you don't harm my, my identity, you didn't harm my needs, and I don't harm your needs or your identity with your goals. So, uh, the best way to solve the problems is through dialogue trying to find win-win solutions, trying to understand what is the needs and are the needs and interests of the communities and trying to find a win-win solution uh, to, the, to these problems. Participation is the capacity to engage in meaningful dialogue. We don't have to start from scratch. There is the science of dialogic design that begins by constructing a shared vision between participants in a dialogue. But in, in light of the contemporary complexity, 
namely that the problems of today are strongly coupled. They're actually a system of problems. We needed to find a methodology to support people to cross disciplinary boundaries, functional boundaries. It gives the people a chance to learn more about the issue and then direct themselves towards a, a solution or some solution or a proposal. We, we shared everything that would be, that would make our life better. Uh, we shared our ideas about politics, about business, non-education, uh, activities. One of the things that this does is that it allows people to say, one second, but I never thought of, I, I didn't know about this approach. I didn't think of it this way. So maybe there's other things that I didn't think about. Awesome. It has to be provocative enough to challenge what's already in the mind of uh, someone. And I believe that it's very, very important to um, to push the the negotiations and the talkings and the meetings between the communities and between the civil societies because it's very important for the area. Uh, during these days, uh, we we knew each other more. And we have had the, the capacity to uh, to understand each other more. Personally, I learned from them, and I'm sure that they learned from me because we shared we shared for the first first time experiences. Uh, you actually talk to other people, you actually dialogue with them, and understand that they're. They have something different, but it's not really wrong. It's actually pretty good, but it's not my own. And so I try to incorporate the good part of what I can get from them into my own self. But as soon as you start dialoguing across um, with people, then you realize cultures themselves are fluid. It takes bits of the real felt truths that everyone holds, and it assembles them into a mosaic with a new form that allows them to re-experience their vision of the world. So dialogue is a useful process for people to reconsider even what culture means. These people end up by developing a common vision, a shared vision, and they also develop a language to describe that vision. And this is a very powerful tool because like in order to build a house, you need to have some dream first. Uh, what do you expect from this house, and then you need to have some designs, and then you go into the actual construction. During these dialogues, um, they, they uh, understood what we want, and what we think of, and how we think of everything, uh, and especially the situation we live in. The best intention, sometimes even leaders who have very good intentions, and they want to engage people in a dialogue, they don't know how to do it. They don't have the tools or the methodology for meaningful engagements, so they fail. I think it all begins by designing the future. In order to make any change, you need to first have a common vision. And this is what we try to do in the bicommunal movements, both here in Cyprus and in Israel and Palestine. We are all aware of evolution. The question that comes to mind, to what extent humanity has learned to be capable of guiding evolution. I think we should stop this conflict by dialogue. Uh, my worry about the future of my children it is to, I would like him to live in peace. I would like to be living without war. I... How did you change through this project? What did you learn? <sighs> First of all, to talk. To talk it's a lot. I mean, we wanted it as an earlier stage to uh, people wake up and uh, start uh, being concerned about Cyprus or about the other. Syria, about other uh, Israel, Palestine, you know. but now we force the person to become conscious. As a human being, to contribute positively to this world. I mean, this, the world is full of problems, 
especially around Cyprus. I mean, needless to say, it's everywhere. Is there's a fire all around us? People suffer. Well, we're all human beings, and we all uh, we all need water, and we all need um, we, we need we need more peace in our lives, and uh, we also need justice. Our problems are man-made. So if, if we make these days, uh, we, we, we may change things also. The voice that raises, uh, raises is talk about the peace, but how we can achieve the peace? What's the practical way to do that? We had, we had enough for now. We had enough of negotiations, we had enough of killing. Uh, mothers are losing their, their child and they haven't seen anything in life. So what I'm saying is that we want peace. We had enough of killing, we had enough of uh, people in prison, spending most of their lives there. So, um, I mean, to start with, let's, let's just say that uh, we want peace. The history of the past, we read it. We are taught when we go to school. The history of the future, we have to create to, together, collectively. And that is why we need help. So we'll be open-minded and try to see things in a more balanced way and uh, look for the truth, but the truth. <laughs> if you always generalize, if you always label the other as the enemy, if you always think that for you to win, the other one has to lose, uh, you, in a way, uh, uh, create situations where it's difficult for the communication to take place. What is needed most uh, within the context of this conflict is hope. Um, we as Palestinians, we're um, like, always we have hope. If I don't have hope, I wouldn't sit here and I wouldn't be in Palestine. I would go abroad, uh, immigrate. So um, I think that uh, having hope is the basic uh, element for me to, to be in Palestine, to live here. It's very difficult to forget, but yeah, we can do it. We can live another life, another way, not for me, for my children, for, for, my, for my future. I want to, to have equal rights with Israelis. Uh, I, ha I want to, to have um, a peace, uh, to, to live happily, to, to, to have everything that uh, anyone in the world have. You're living, but you don't have a reason for living. So when you have hope, you, you, are, you are aiming to do something in the future, and you are, you are believing that this thing might happen, and it will happen eventually, hopefully. Lost voices in history's abrupt returns, in faceless bloody walls and fences with tears, where sharp swords split the ground apart without noise, and the souls are painfully cut by bleeding wounds without blood. Borders of shadowed oppressors, without bridges to cross, without an inch of land to plant a hope or a flower, unsaid, painful memories of an expelled past, meaningless certainties of those who have died while they were still engraving the pathway for the newborns to come. Is there any way to liberate us from the present? How can we will the future that we owe to live? How can we envision new, consensual truths? A child without a face is still hoping for the white pigeon and the olive branch, while the snake's womb is still hiding invisible chains without a lock. The sting of an old bite, sneaky and fatal, runs within our veins. How can we transcend it? How can we cure it for good? How can we escape labels, names and narratives when the world is perpetually entrapped by them? Beyond walls, 
Beyond borders, there is groundless ground for a new revolution to emerge by the people and for the people as the pathway for an ideal common future. Here, in the Middle East of our predicament, where stones have become heroes and hero stones, division still conceals the real hopes and necessities and voices create the new language of truth. Barrier ahead, slow down. The power of people sees no barriers. Let us overcome them. Let us dialogue beyond them.